Let us pray. Forgiving God, we come to you in order to repent from the ways of the world, so to follow your teachings, to follow the teachings of your Son, the Christ. Your kingdom and your realm is within our midst, a way of life that brings joy and freedom from sinness, sin and sadness. Our hearts are purified by your most Holy Spirit, so that we might have new life in your risen Son, and can experience your realm in the here and now, as we pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. Our scripture lesson today is full of all kinds of important and wondrous information that literally, literally could produce a dozen sermons, no problem. But today, we're going to look at what John's proclamation means to us today. But first, the writer of Matthew has just finished the birth narrative and the family's flight to, to Egypt and back, and then he jumps right into the prophetic ministry of John the Baptist. And yet, he never mentions the familial relationship between Jesus and John as cousins. Instead, the writer of Matthew finds it more important to show Jesus fulfills the foretold expectation of Scripture. In other words, Matt, the writer of Matthew is more interested in showing that Jesus fulfills this old, old Testament Scriptures than anything else. This is the major theme of Matthew's text. And for example, John's presence in the wilderness would remind his listeners of Israel's exodus from Egypt. The voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight, which is, of course, as an excerpt from Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 3. Now, if you've noticed, I keep saying the writer of Matthew, the writer of Matthew. Well, that's because Matthew would have been 70 to 90 years old if he had actually written this particular gospel. You see, the gospel is written 80 to 90 A.D., and the average age for a man in Jesus' day was about 40 years old. So Matthew would have been quite an elder if he actually wrote this, script, uh, wrote this gospel. But what is, and so the scholars, biblical scholars <coughs> truly do not believe that Matthew, the same Matthew that was a tax collector and went with Jesus, was one of his disciples, was actually the writer of this particular gospel. It was very common in those days for a disciple's student to write in his name. So more than likely, this is actually a student of Matthew who wrote the stories that Matthew told him and gave credit to his mentor, <coughs> that being Matthew. But regardless, that's just a little side note for your information. John's call to people to repent was not new at all. Many prophets, long before John, and even King Solomon himself, call for people of Israel to repent. But John's proclamation was different. His reason to repent was because the kingdom of heaven has, has come near. Since the verb used in Greek is in the perfect tense, the kingdom of heaven is no longer a future event that remains somewhere way off in the distance. Instead, John's announcement reveals for the first time that the kingdom of heaven is a present reality. And this is an important message for us today. But before we get there, <coughs> let's look at the rest of the lesson, because it has some wonderful information in it. For instance, John's outfit is a parallel to Elijah, who was described as a hairy man with a leather belt around his waist. And while insects were forbidden foods in the Levit Levitical law, locusts and crickets were considered clean. And the honey... Well, the honey reminded the listener of Israel's past wilderness experience when people ate manna in the wilderness and it taste, the taste was like wafers made with honey from Exodus chapter 16, verse 31. And again, the hearers of this gospel would be reminded of the prophecies of the great prophets. But the message changes completely when John sees the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming. And he immediately calls them for what they are, a brood of vipers. 
And he asked, who warned you about the wrath to come? Another reference to the prophets. Here it corresponds with Elijah's return in the book of Malachi, where the prophet warns, Lo, I will send you the, prophets, the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Now, did you notice that? There were two realities there. Two realities were spoken there. The great and the terrible day of the Lord. Now, that meant that the day of the Lord would be joyful for those who did, in fact, repent. And it would be pretty much terrible for those who didn't. And obviously, John believes that the Pharisees and the Sadducees fit in that latter category of those who don't repent. And he believes that their desire to be baptized is nothing more than an attempt of bogus piety. They simply want to show off in front of the crowds. Since everyone else is going out to be baptized, they too need to go out and show that they are followers of God as well. And John warns them, though, that they need to bear fruit of repentance. Because there's one that is greater than he who's coming to baptize them with the Holy Spirit and fire. And not only will he separate the righteous from the unrighteous, but he will burn the chaff. That's the leftover trash from the wheat chaff when it's harvested so it can be burned into ashes. Now the Holy Spirit and the fire, remember fire purifies, it used to purify the gold and the silver. And that's what that Jesus is referring to, or John the Baptist is referring to, is the fire that Jesus purifies our souls. Now that's a lot of reference material to try to comprehend in one scripture lesson. So let's just let's so how do we all make sense of all of this? Well, there's very two very important themes that we want to look at today. And the first was the one I mentioned earlier, which was the kingdom of heaven has come near. It's no longer a future event. Jesus has ushered in a new way of life and a new opportunity for humanity. The kingdom of heaven, also referred to as the kingdom of God, is available to us in the here and now. John is referring to Jesus himself ushering in the acknowledgement that we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit for those of Jesus' day and for us today. John the Baptist reminds us that Jesus' presence in our lives teaches us that God's Spirit is with us on our daily walk. We don't go anywhere in this life without God with us. Emmanuel. The second theme is where the baptism we receive through our belief in Christ's teachings gives us new life through the purifying of our souls by the Holy Spirit. We have power. We have life. We have eternal life. And we have God's very presence in the here and now. You don't have to wait until you pass away and die to be face to face with your Lord. The opportunities are here, now. God is now a personal part of who and what we are. The opportunities that lay at our feet to utilize the power of God's Spirit is absolutely remarkable and literally mind-blowing. Here we are about to celebrate the birth of Jesus the Christ, who gives us new life, new power, and new opportunities, and a whole new outlook on life itself. Life now does not end. It only transforms from this reality to a new one that is face to face with our Creator in the next world as well as here. And better yet, while on this earth, we carry around with us the very essence of God in our bodies. Look at the power of our prayer ministry here at Trinity. Look at the power of the missions that we do here at Trinity. Look at the power of your lives to change this world to the acts of love and compassion. This scripture lesson today should fill you with a newfound power, a newfound strength, and a newfound hope for your life now and your life eternal. This scripture, even though it is 2,000 years old, reminds us of what we are and what we have the opportunity
opportunity to be. It teaches us that God provides us with a power we are to use on a daily basis, today, in the here and now. So, may you use this newfound power to enrich your life, your community, and your world.